Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone. We have a, a number who are tuning in online and watching uh, through our website. We have 44 devices tuned in from Arizona, Arkansas, Iowa, Kansas, uh, and Texas, and of course Oklahoma. So glad that y'all are with us. We are in a series about keeping in step with the Spirit. Last night, uh, I was in bed and, uh, and partly asleep, and I needed to go up, uh, I needed to get up and use the restroom, and so I did, but in doing so, I'm, I'm out of it, and I'm uh, not really awake and not really wanting to get awake, and uh, so I l- kind of leave the lights off in our uh, bathroom, and in our bathroom, we have a cage, uh, a crate, like a metal uh, crate, which is literally a cage for our dog Leon. When we leave the house, we crate him. And so that metal cage is also in our bathroom. And um, so when I leave the bathroom to go back to the bed, I don't have the lights on. And I forget exactly where that cage was, but my pinky toe found it. (laughs) And I have this pinky toe that really doesn't help me at all. It, it, It sits up like, like it's, like it's nervous and looking around. So it doesn't even, you know, they say every toe matters and you're balancing. And I've got on, on this foot, no, that one's just there. And so now, but it reminds me every step I take, turn the light on. Turn the light on. You, don't, you can't see where you're supposed to step if you don't turn the light on. And our, our sermon is about stepping with the Spirit. Um, walking where God's Spirit is, walking where God is. And so um, let's start in Galatians chapter 5. If you want to turn there, Galatians 5. And so we have verse 16 and verse 18 and verse 25. Uh, We really have four different ways that say the same thing, but uh, verse 16, I say walk... By the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. And then verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Uh, In other words, follow God. Where's God going? Follow Him. Walk where God walks. Walk where the Spirit walks. And that's true with our minds. Our minds need to go where God is. Our minds need to be spirit-led. Our bodies need to be spirit-led. Our eyes, where are our eyes, where are our hearts? And so then in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, this is what the Spirit produces in our life if we will let it, let Him. The Spirit will produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. There are no laws on the planet against you being kind, or you being good, or you having self-control, um, being patient. And so today's topic, we're talking about peace. And in Romans 14, 17, uh, this verse says, The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. And if you look earlier in Romans in this chapter, the topic here is they have a controversy because some are eating Meat that was maybe previously sacrificed to idols, and, and others thought that was absolutely wrong to do that. And, and so uh, there was a controversy about eating meat. And in verse 3 of chapter 14, Paul says, let, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. Let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. That was an issue of conscience, and the church was divided over it. And Satan loved it. And Satan continues to get us divided. Satan will try to divide us. He doesn't care what it is. doesn't care what the issue is. It doesn't, doesn't matter if it's the color of carpet. I thought crimson carpet would look really good in here. Uh, but we didn't get that. But it doesn't matter what we are fussing about. Satan is glad and God is sad. But look at what the kingdom of God is supposed to be about. The kingdom of God is the church. So that's us. kingdom of God is about righteousness peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So I want to talk uh, today about having peace in three different ways. Uh, The first way is peace with God. The second way is peace in suffering or in trials. And the third way is peace with other people. 
But starting out, peace with God, Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is not saying uh, peace with God's help. This is saying peace in our relationship with God. Because when we sin, our sin separates us from God. So in, gr in growing up, when you sin for the first time, and you are the, of the age of accountability, sin separates us from God. He can't just overlook it. He cannot just forgive it. And that means we are at odds with God. And we could not solve that problem on our own. We could not be good enough. It's like a it's like a murderer before a judge saying, Judge, I've stopped murdering, and I'm going to be real good from here on, and, I'm, and, and I intend to make up for the murder I committed. You can't do that. That charge is still against that man. But Jesus paid our charge. He paid our debt. He was our sacrifice. And so our peace with God is our relationship with God. If you don't realize that in your past, if you're of the age of accountability, in your past you had separation from God. And you may not even know it. But through Jesus Christ, we have peace with God. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. But that conflict with God is our greatest conflict we've ever had. It's the greatest problem you've ever had and will ever have is being at odds with God. Have you ever been at odds with someone you're in relationship with? A friendship, a family member, maybe a spouse, you've been at odds with them? Some of you are nodding your heads really strongly. Um, and when you're at odds with someone, it's, dis it's stressful. There's no greater stress than being at odds with God. And we don't fully understand that because um, God doesn't reveal everything to us. But I just want you to know that your greatest Greatest gift is peace with God. And God gave it through Jesus Christ. All right, now peace and suffering are in trials. Romans 4.25 says, it's talking about Jesus, um, excuse me, John 6, let's go to John 16.33. Peace in suffering uh, or peace in trials, peace in uncertain times or in a storm of life. Verse 33 says, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So Jesus is talking to his apostles. This is near the time that this is uh, near the time when he's going to be crucified. He'll rise from the dead, but I mean, these are some of his last words. And he's telling them, in the world you're going to have tribulation, you'll have trials, but in Christ you'll have peace. So where are we? If in the world you have tribulation and in Christ you have peace, where are you? Where are we? Where are we supposed to be? Um, but the answer to this is we're, we are in both of those places. We live in the world. And God didn't call us to be removed from the world. How can we reach the world with the gospel if we're removed from it? So we have to live in the world. Doesn't the world worry you? Doesn't our society, our um, just people, doesn't this planet that we live on, don't we have trials? God doesn't take the Christian and, and, uh, and put them in a bubble where, where nothing stresses them. Wouldn't that be nice? And incidentally, there was a place like that, and it was called the Garden of Eden. And there's going to be a place like that in our future, God willing, and that's heaven but right now, this world is broken and it has tribulation. We are in it, but if we're in Christ in the world, we have peace in the storm. Do you remember the time Jesus was in the boat sleeping? The story about Jesus, they're trying to cross the Sea of Galilee. He has some of his apostles with him. He's in the boat. Uh, he's in a place where he could sleep, and, and evidently it was peaceful, and then a storm came up. And the storm is rocking the boat, and the water's coming in the boat, and the apostles think they're about to die, and they have to wake Jesus up because he's sleeping. They say, Jesus, do you not care we're about to die? How could you sleep in the middle of a storm? If you walk close enough with God, you can sleep in the middle of a storm. <clears throat> and you could do that physically, but I really mean spiritually. And uh, symbolically in, in the storms and trials in our life. So let's go to a great passage, Philippians 4, verse 6. We'll start in verse 6. 
This passage is about how to have peace in a storm, in a trial. Um, do any of you, are any of you in a trial right now? Anyone here worried about something? Uh, having anxiety and stress about something that's uncertain or something that is certain, but you're having to go through it. And it's hard, it's painful, uh, maybe it's lonely, and maybe uh, sometimes the hardest thing is, is not knowing. I would imagine most of us could say yes to that. Now, some, some of you are in a really good place right now. Life's good. God's shining His face on you. Praise God. Think things are wonderful. Thank God for it. But if you're in a storm or a trial, this is how to go through it and have peace. Verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Prayer and supplication. So pray about it. Pray to God about it. Uh, we talked last week about sometimes people struggle to pray for themselves. They feel like that is selfish. That's a misunderstanding. That's a lie from Satan to say that, no, you shouldn't bother God with that. Uh, God has bigger things to worry about. The truth is God's not limited by time. He's not limited by energy. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't sleep. You are as valuable as any soul on this planet, and God sent his son to die for you. God has time for you, and God says, ask me. So we put it before God. We pray to God, but we do it with thanksgiving. Meaning, don't forget to remember what God's already done for you. Don't forget to remember what you've already been blessed with. You have the physical ability to get up, travel across town, come in a building and worship with God's saints. A lot of people can't do that. We have, uh, we have people who are shut in, uh, older ones who would crawl to get here if they could. And many of them watch remotely, some of them maybe not even able to do that. But be thankful for what God has already blessed you with. Pray about it, and then look at what happens. Verse 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. What that means is you'll pray, and you'll have faith, and you'll trust God, and there will be times when God will grant you peace in your heart. You'll feel a calmness, and your mind says, this is weird because I should be stressed right now, but I feel incredibly calm. And you better thank God for that. Thank God for that. Many of you have experienced that. It's a peace that doesn't make sense. It's beyond understanding, but it will guard. Look at what God is guarding with peace. He wants to guard your heart and your mind. What happens when you're in a trial? Your mind and your heart both are in hyperdrive. Your mind is worrying. What if this happens? What if that happens? Uh, you know, I don't know how I'm going to get through this, or this is going to be bad, or this is already bad, or your mind just goes. What happens here? In your, in your heart area, you feel anxiety physically. Physically. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Worrying with your mind and your heart, right? We do that. And you can't calm this, and you can't calm this, and you try to, you try to say, self, quit it. Stop. Do something else. And you try, and you try, and you still struggle. And what God is saying is, count your blessings, give it to God, Trust Him. Trust Him. And He will work with you. He will work to protect your mind, to calm your mind and give it peace, and calm your heart and give it peace. And you'll, it won't be perfect because you'll go in and out from trusting. If you're like me, you'll trust and you'll find some peace and you'll be good for a moment or a day or a time, and then you'll go back to worrying. Because the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, Jesus said. And then, um, well, I want to I, I give you an example of a, a trial that was in my life. Uh, it's not the biggest trial by any means. And so I'm not trying to give you something to, to show you just a, a, you know, an extreme. or I'm not saying there are not bigger, uh, larger worries that people have. There certainly are. But uh, a couple years ago, Stephanie and I... So we were going to sell our house, which we did. We were trying to sell our house, and then we were going to move into a rent house, which we did. 
So in selling our house, the worry was, well, my first worry was, how do we get this place uh, cleaned up and decluttered so that someone would walk in and say, I want this one? So that was a big worry. But anyway, we, we um, uh, rented a dumpster. That's my first advice for you if you're ever in that situation. <laughs> and that was glorious. So, but we got the place ready to show, and then we showed it and had some people come, okay, and uh, and when someone says, I kind of like, I like your house, I think I want to buy it, they'll put a contract on it, and the next 10 days is somewhat of a negotiation period because when the inspection comes back, when someone has been paid to go in and find every single thing wrong with a house built in 1978 and one that's not been uh, uh, excellently maintained, uh, which is my fault, but anyway, they find a lot of stuff. And so then the buyer may or may go forward from there when they say, yes, they'll go forward, which they did, we had 30 days to not be there. Well, that's okay uh, because I thought there are places to rent, and we both have jobs, so we have income to be able to pay for the rent. So I thought, this won't be so bad. Let's find a place to live now. And I go to look for a place to live, and it's really hard to find. It's really hard to find because... Uh, houses were selling quickly and rentals were going quickly and I, we found one and we applied and we got an application they said come look at it we did and I realized when you when you try to get a rent house you're trying to get a job they have others that they're considering they're going to decide which one they're going to rent to you're you're trying to win them over uh it's a anyway a unique experience if you've not done that and so it's not as easy as just well here's one let me call them and see if it's available and then we'll, we'll go tell them, yes, we'd like to live there. It's not that easy. So we didn't get that rent house. They chose someone else, those um, wonderful people. And so uh, in hindsight, that was a wonderful thing because God had something better to bless us with. We ended up renting a house from uh, the most wonderful landlord you could ever ask for. And uh, that's a true statement. Quit laughing. So uh, that, that, that's hand to God. What, what ended up happening is um, the landlord had really three or four houses that uh, she was renovating to rent, and they were coming available right when we needed a house. Not only were we able to find a rent house, but able to choose a rent house, and one that was recently renovated. My point is, back here I'm worrying, what am I going to do? Because I thought, well, we could go live with mom and dad, and um, you know they really don't have the space for it, but instead of being under a bridge, I'm sure if we knocked on the door, and if we put Abby first, and we put, <laughs> and we put Leon last, he's the dog, he's the Yorkie. We put him last, Abby, you know, and surely they would let us sleep on the couch. But that's not a great situation. And I was genuinely worried. What are we going to do? Where are we going to live? And God had things in the works. God is working for your solutions before you even know you have a problem. Amen. Did you know that? Yes. We don't have enough faith in what God is doing. So this next part, verse 8, says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise. By the way, when you watch the news at the end of a newscast, you may not get much of this list. Uh, sometimes you do. The, the news tries to give you some good news, but that doesn't get viewers. Did you know that? Is that not crazy? Good news doesn't get people to tune in. Uh, but if you think the sky is falling, you'll tune in. Anyway, so things in our world that are good, that are worthy of praise. We have young people going to camp this week. They're leaving today. They're going to go to church camp for a week and there is some air conditioning there, but there's a lot of um, not air conditioning there. And our young people, they turn their cell phones in. Did you know that? Uh, uh, young people, if you didn't know that, go ahead and go to camp anyway. Just go ahead. <laughs> but they're going to spend a week growing closer to God. 
They're going to learn more. They're going to grow in their faith by leaps and bounds in a matter of days. That's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing. When you So understand this. What you think about affects how you feel. If you think about your fears and your worries, uh, what does that give you feeling-wise? It gives you anxiety. You think about your worries, your problems, you'll feel anxiety and dread. If you think about things you want that you don't have, what will you feel? Things that you want that you don't have, you may feel greed, you may feel dissatisfaction, you may feel envy. If you think about your past hurts and resentments, anybody ever wronged you? Do you ever watch that movie again? I like OU football, and I watch previous year's games, only the ones they win. Uh, but I'll re-watch those games. I like that. I like it. I know they're going to win that game. I enjoy it. Um, but we do that with the bad things in our past. Anyone ever hurt you? You ever play that movie in your head? And when you do, what does it make you feel? It makes you feel bitter. Bitter. If you think about your past mistakes and failures, do you ever do that? You ever play that show? It makes you feel shame. But if you think about things that are true and lovely and commendable and excellent and praiseworthy, it will give you peace, it will give you joy, it will give you gratitude. And there's a whole field of psychology called cognitive therapy, and it thinks, that field of psychology thinks, they've really discovered something. Because if you change how you think, and you think not only true but positive, you feel better. And there's a whole... I took an entire course on cognitive therapy, and that's, that's it in a, in a nutshell. And the field of psychology thinks they've discovered something, but it dawned on me, you know, my Bible says the same thing. It was 2,000 years ago. I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just saying we didn't make it up. God did. God did, and he, he has told us this for years. Change what you're thinking about. Now, let's go a little further. Isaiah 20, let's go further back in time. This is, this is not 2,000 years, but this is uh, well more than that. Isaiah 26, 3, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. This is in the storm, by the way. This is in your trial. You have peace. Why? Because you're trusting in God and you're thinking about God and God's protecting your heart. And then a great passage on uh, what we think about and how it affects us, Romans 8, 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. What affects what we think about? Do you, do you listen to music? And if so, what kind of music? Do you watch uh, TV or movies? And if so, what kind? Do you spend time on social media? Uh, so much of social media is things of the flesh. So much of it. Things of the flesh. And if we have our minds set on things of the flesh, that leads to death. So let me read this. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. That's what we want. We want peace. If you want peace, God's telling you how to get peace. Get your mind on God more. Change what comes in and have God come in more. I've, I've uh, developed a habit I'm trying to stick with. My habit is when I leave the house, I turn on, I, I have my phone instead of playing music, which I enjoy, uh, all types of music, uh, but... I have my phone play scripture. Right now I'm in Deuteronomy 22. There's some tough stuff back there. Deuteronomy 22. But I enjoy it even though we're not under that covenant. It's the same God who cares the same thing about right and wrong, sin uh, and godliness. And I try to do that. I've been doing that so far when I leave the house for my day on my way here usually. Um, that's what I do on that trip. Listen to God's Word. 
My mind needs more of God's word in it. I need more peace, and that's how we get it. Verse 7, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. <clears throat> this is about people who they might believe in God, but they're not pleasing God. Why? Because they're not submitting to God. Why are they not submitting? Because their mind is not on God. If you have your mind on God Sunday, but Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday, your mind is on the world, you will not submit to God because your mind's not on God. People don't submit to God who are living their own way, their own life. They're handling things their way. They're doing what they want. And that's hostile to God because they're not thinking about where would God want me to step. Instead, they're thinking about where do I think I ought to step. And we all have opinions, but they're not the right place to step. In verse 10, If Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. This is talking about... Um, when, I, when your life is death, your body is death, your body is going to die because of sin. That goes back to Adam and Eve being kicked out of the garden. But we're trying to live with God for eternity. And we need to walk with God here in order to do that. You can have peace in your trial. So if you're in a trial right now, you can have peace in that if you pray and you trust and you have your mind on things of the Spirit. Get your mind on things of the Spirit. Isn't that simple? So let me, uh, let's hit on this, uh, this last part, peace with others. Romans 12, 16, live, with har live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. This is where if my mind is not set on God, I'll do what I want to do. Now, I think I'm pretty smart personally. I like my ideas. But doesn't Scripture say not to do that? Never be wise in your own sight. Never be wise in your own sight. So how do we make decisions if you can't trust yourself? You pray about it. You read your Bible. You lean on God. What would God have me do here? What, what is the right thing to do? Well, I don't want to do that. Do it anyway. Don't trust your dumb self. Trust God. Do it anyway. That's, that's what walking in the Spirit and with the Spirit and where the Spirit's walking, that's what that means. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Uh, beloved, in this verse 19 helped me a lot when I was in a um, going through... Uh, a, a trial of being betrayed by someone. Verse 19, Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. That one helped me a lot to know that God can take care of justice because I wanted justice. I wanted somebody to have some comeuppance. A big helping of it is what I wanted. But that's not our job. Have you ever heard the phrase, You can't please everyone? What does verse 18 say? As far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. It may be true that you can't please everyone, but God says try anyway. Try to please everyone regarding peace. Live it, get along with people. Live peaceably with people. Look at this, Hebrews 12, 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness of without which no one will see the Lord. Can you tell that verse is saying, walk where God is walking. Quit walking where you want to walk. Strive for peace with people. James 3.16, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, good fruits, impartial, sincere, a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace, by those who make peace. That's what we're talking about having peace. Sometimes the hardest part of it is other people. 
And God says the answer to that is not changing other people. You change. You change. Someone cuts in front of you, let them. Let them. Live at peace with people. You say, no, they need to be taught a lesson. Well, let their holy God in heaven teach them a lesson. You let them in. Maybe they need mercy that day. Maybe they need grace. If they're tailgating you, I want to brake check them. I want to brake check them. Maybe what I need to do if I'm driving under the speed limit, which I do sometimes when I'm thinking too much and I'm not in a hurry, maybe I need to speed up to the speed limit. You do what you can do to make peace with people. Psalm 119.65, we'll, we'll leave with this verse. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. We want peace. God says, do you love this? And Psalm 119, did you notice what verse this is? Verse 165. If you didn't know, that's a high number for a verse in your Bible. That's because Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. That whole chapter is about love for this, love for God's Word. Now, man made the chapters. God didn't divide the Bible up into chapters, but I think it is fitting that the longest chapter is about love for God's Word. Read it. Have it read to you. If you need help with that, come find me. You'll be amazed how your mind changes when you get more of God's Word in it. We're going to sing a song uh, of encouragement this morning. And if you're here and maybe something with this lesson, maybe you need peace and you're really struggling with that, uh, we'd love to pray for you about that. Maybe there's something else going on in your life that's, that is uh, really weighing you down. Uh, bring that to us. Let us pray for you. If there's one here this morning, maybe you've never given your life to Christ, never had your sins washed away in baptism. If we can help you in some way, please come while we stand and sing. Heal at the cross, Christ will meet you there. He